good afternoon, uh, morning, and evening. Uh, this is Ken Johnson, and, and welcome to uh, the SOCOM webinar series. Uh, and FYI for everyone, this will be the last webinar of the spring, and, and we will start up again um, next fall, I believe. Is that right, Roberta? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and and so today we, we, we get a, a view from the other side of the ocean, the atmosphere, and we're going to hear from uh, Britt Steffens on uh, uh, oceanography. Yeah, he's got a new title here, but the webinar title was Oceanography at 360 Knots. Um, Britt is a, a scientist at uh, NCAR, uh, received his bachelor's degree from Harvard in 1993, and many of you know him from his PhD work at Scripps, where he finished in uh, 1999, and we're uh, probably all very familiar with his work on um, the interaction of sea ice and, and uh, ocean outgassing and climate and, and uh, climate cycles, as well as his, his work on oxygen and, and uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And so uh, today, Britt is going to update us on the Orcas project, which is uh, uh, was looking at a series of aircraft flights over the Southern Ocean, looking at oxygen and atmosphere, uh, oxygen and CO2 in the atmosphere. And I, and I just have to interject that I, I always thought I would have it made when I got to travel around in a Gulf Stream G5. And so we get to now hear from Britt, who apparently has it made. And here's Britt. Well, yeah, the grass is always greener, I guess. Um, I'll show you a few photos. It's not, um, it's, it's not uh, quite as glorious as it might sound, but it is, uh, it is fun to, um, you know, be able to do science in, in this way, uh, having spent a lot of time on uh, research cruises as well. So uh, thanks for that introduction, Ken. Uh, apologies for accidentally swapping out my title there, uh, but the, uh, I am talking about the Orcas project, which recently completed at the end of February, and we're still, you know, digging out from the uh, volume of data that we've collected, but uh, it was a very successful campaign, and we uh, conducted a bunch of flights over the uh, Southern Ocean, uh, based out of Punta Arenas, Chile, uh, and flying, uh, you know, upwind and downwind of Drake Passage and uh, around uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, this photo is from a profile that was done over the, the Lawrence M. Gould um, to uh, do some remote sensing as well as atmospheric gas sampling. So. Uh, I'm representing a very large uh, science team. I won't have uh, time to thank everyone by name, and, and I have to apologize for the people I've undoubtedly left off, but uh, quite a few people have contributed and participated, and it's uh, been great being involved in a project that's uh, sort of in training uh, people as we go along. Um, some of the PIs there you probably recognize um, from other projects, and uh, we have uh, components of the project focused on carbon cycle measurements, reactive gas measurements, um, remote sensing of ocean color, uh, react, uh, sorry, cloud microphysics, and, uh, and then a bunch of sort of forecasting support and some uh, great help uh, on education and outreach and some sort of growing external collaborations that we're excited about. And of course, we need to thank uh, NSF Polar Programs, um, as well as atmospheric chemistry and NASA. Uh, ocean biology and biogeochemistry for supporting the project. Uh, the general outline of my talk is shown here. I'll just go through some of the motivations uh, for the project and, and what we were hoping to achieve. I'll talk about uh, some of the instrumentation and modeling tools that we have at our, uh, re uh, have at our fingertips. Uh, and I'll go through a, an individual flight uh, to give a little bit more detail uh, on, on what we uh, did and what what were our, our initial results are showing us, uh, and then there are a few things that just sort of jump out from the whole campaign that I'll try and share. We have a lot of ongoing um, analyses to dig in in more detail, but at, at this stage, just sort of one month after getting home, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just focus on on the big picture, and then I'll just try and highlight some of what we're hoping to do and how that might link up with SOCOM. The map on the right is uh, where we flew uh, in this six week period um, within a total of 19 flights. And if you turn that on the side, you'd see that we were going up and down most of the time from the surface to anywhere between um, two kilometers and 12 kilometers altitude. So the motivation for ORCAs uh, is very similar to that for SOCOM. I, I, you probably could have pulled these first two bullets off the SOCOM webpage somewhere. 
but uh, hopefully most people uh, appreciate that the Southern Ocean is an important sink for anthropogenic CO2, and uh, we don't really know how that's going to behave in the future, uh, and we don't have really the process level understanding necessary to, to make um, good predictions. Um, and that's highlighted by the fact that our system models diverge quite dramatically for um, predictions of Southern Ocean CO2 fluxes, uh, as well as oxygen uh, and their feedbacks with climate. Uh, this particular project focuses on uh, oxygen um, primarily because it provides some uh, really unique uh, constraints on the different processes that are influencing CO2 exchange. So the things that we uh, thought about that led us to uh, you know, proposing this project is that uh, you, there's a need for both, uh, you know, what SOCOM is doing is, is deploying uh, measurements in a long-term fashion that are dispersed over the entire Southern Ocean. So there's, of course, a really critical need for that, uh, but there are some things you can only learn by going out um, and measuring as much as you can over a short period of time, um, both, uh, intensive in time and space um, and and with this aircraft you can actually do really high resolution measurements over a really large area so both of these things are needed and in my view are quite complementary um, the atmosphere um, when you're sort of used to thinking about oceanography from the ocean uh, in the atmosphere in contrast uh, provides a very integrated view of air sea fluxes so uh, you measure something in the air that's been influenced by uh, processes at the air-sea interface over a very large area. Um, that's true of surface sites where we're collecting flash samples for different gas measurements, but uh, it's been really hard to interpret the data from the surface sites because of our uncertainties in representing atmospheric transport accurately. And also because those surface sites are very sparse everywhere and in the Southern Ocean they're, of course, extremely sparse. So an aircraft uh, has the advantage of being able to uh, measure, scale, uh, measure signals that represent even larger scales than service sites. And also by going up and down through the atmosphere, we can uh, really overcome these problems with um, the atmospheric transport models, which primarily relate to, to vertical mixing. So this is a picture of the NSF NCAR Gulfstream 5 jet. Um, it, you can see some uh, pylons sticking off the top and the bottom where we suck in air and there's some probes hanging off of the bottoms of the wings uh, where a lot of the aerosol and cloud microphysics measurements get done. In this, predict this photo is from an earlier project, but in this project we had the PRISM uh, NASA ocean color sensor, which looked through a, a hole in the bottom of the G5. So, um, so I mentioned that the models diverge a lot for Southern Ocean um, CO2 predictions. Um, that's true of their long-term feedbacks to climate change, but uh, we can also focus in on the seasonal cycle because that, that is very indicative of sort of process um, level fidelity in the models. You'd hope that a model that you know, you're using to project out 50 years is able to get the seasonal cycle right. So the plot on the upper left is from the Anav et al. CMEP5 study just showing the seasonal CO2 uh, fluxes predicted for the Southern Ocean and, and it's you know, complete spaghetti. So, um, looking at this plot, you'd think that the models um, really have um, a lot of problems in the processes in the Southern Ocean, but if you stare uh, more closely at it, you can see it's not completely random. What's actually, it actually looks like some of the models are 180 degrees out of phase with the others. Um, so some of them are think, think CO2 goes out in the summer and some thinks it goes out in the winter. On the right is uh, a collection of models. Um, that I put together for, with some collaborators for another study um, showing the oxygen fluxes for the Southern Ocean. And they're at least all consistent in, in general in terms of phase uh, and amplitude, although um, in both of these plots, the thick black line is an observationally based estimate uh, based on measurements in the surface water of either PCO2 or dissolved oxygen. The Takahashi on the left and the Garcia and Keeling climatology on the right. So why is this? Why are the models so bad at CO2 in the Southern Ocean? The lower two plots try to illustrate this. Um, so the blue lines in the lower plots are the same as the black lines in the top plot. So in the lower left is the Takahashi 2009 estimate of CO2 fluxes. This is south of 40, uh, 44 south. 
And uh, you can use SST to make an estimate of the thermal contribution to the CO2 flux, and that's shown in red. And then you can subtract those to, to infer what the non-thermal component is, which is which would primarily be biology. So what you see for CO2 is that the sort of the biological component and the, the thermal component are in direct opposition. And that's because uh, in the summer, which is over here, uh, you're warming the ocean, driving uh, CO2 out from the thermal effect, but you also have productivity going on, sucking CO2 in. And the opposite happens in the winter. So what, what you actually see at the air sea interface is this small balance between two big fluxes. For oxygen, um, it's a lot uh, nicer situation, at least from an interpretation point of view. So the, um, we use heat fluxes to estimate what the thermal component is of the oxygen fluxes. And, and what you see is that the thermal and biological components go in the same direction. So in the summer, you're warming the surface water, driving oxygen out uh, through the change in solubility. And you also have productivity going on that's driving oxygen out um, by the production of oxygen in surface waters. So, uh, you know, a 10% difference, a 10% error in the model representation of either the biological or thermal component can lead to a 100% error in the, uh, in the balance, whereas a 10% error in either component for oxygen might lead to a 5% error in the total. So uh, because of this, um, by measuring both CO2 and oxygen, we can actually try and tease out um, what's going on with the models in terms of their biological and thermal forcing. Okay, so just a little bit of bookkeeping here, um, and as background, uh, we've been measuring atmospheric oxygen uh, as a community in the atmosphere for uh, almost 25 years. This is the record from Ralph Keeling's laboratory at Scripps um, for two stations, alert in black in the northern hemisphere and Cape Grim in red in the southern hemisphere, CO2 and oxygen. So uh, the challenge in measuring oxygen is that there's so much oxygen in the air um, that uh, the relative precision is very demanding and also changes in other gases can uh, can change the mole fraction of oxygen at levels that that you care about so it actually turns out that um, to talk about oxygen concentrations in the atmosphere you, we have to um, it, it, it's necessary to relate, relate them in terms of deviations in the oxygen nitrogen ratio uh, in order to uh, exclude the influence of of diluting effects of other gases. So the unit we use, if you haven't seen it before, is a per mag. This is a part per million relative change in the oxygen nitrogen ratio. It's very similar to isotope notation. Uh, um, so uh, if you're used to dealing with, uh, say, per mil of C13 or C14, this is a, a thousandth of a per mil. And of course, uh, uh, oxygen is going down in the atmosphere faster than CO2 is going up. And that's because uh, of the net ocean CO2 stink. And, and I won't talk about that much here, but that's one of the big applications of oxygen measurements um, is, is teasing those two things out. So we have had some prior observations in the uh, focused observations in the Southern Ocean that I'll go through quickly because they provide important background for our study. The HIPPO project, which ran from 2009 to 2011, did essentially one flight over the Southern Ocean out of Christchurch uh, in January of 2009 uh, in the summer that showed this huge plume of oxygen coming out of the surface uh, water. So we've known that there's sort of this large um, feature in the atmosphere, uh, both vertical and spatial, uh, of oxygen outgassing from the Southern Ocean. Um, and, and we wanted to go back and explore it in more detail. Um, at the same time, uh, Ralph's uh, lab has been measuring flasks from Palmer Station and South Pole. And what I'm plotting on the left here is uh, all of the monthly mean values over uh, 20 years um, with the Palmer measurements subtracted from the, sorry, the South Pole measurements subtracted from the Palmer measurements. So uh, in the top, it's for CO2. Um, and what you see, uh, there's 18 months shown here. So uh, in winter time, um, CO2 is uh, higher at Palmer than at South Pole. And during summer, CO2 is lower at Palmer at South Pole. Uh, and the opposite is true for oxygen. Uh, during summer, oxygen is higher at South Pole, as is higher at Palmer, and during winter, oxygen is lower at Palmer. So, so this is consistent with our general uh, understanding, um, if not with all of those models I showed a few slides ago. And what you see in January and February is this really tight correlation between oxygen and CO2, where you have strong outgassing of oxygen implied over the Southern Ocean and ingassing of CO2. And, and these are shown again in XY space here, oxygen versus CO2, as the red 
line in the right, um, where is the, uh, the collection of models I showed previously, as well as uh, the Garcia and Keeling and Takahashi climatologies are, are underlain. I, I don't have time to go into all the details of the models, but the, 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 the feature that sort of to me is most intriguing is that here's a case where the real world is showing a really tight correlation and the models are showing um, sort of uh, a less um, well-defined correlation. You, generally what you find is when you go out in the real world, you measure things that are messier than what, what you're modeling. So this is the opposite case. So we've stared at this plot for a really long time and tried to think about what causes a model to be in, a ver in various quadrants. But ultimately what the observations are telling us is that biology appears to be dominating the southern, the summertime fluxes with uh, anti strong anti-correlations and the spatial gradients over the southern ocean. Um, and if you tweak a model, as uh, Matt Long has shown, um, in various ways, you can you can actually get the model to swing into uh, into these other quadrants. So that's sort of the background for orcas, um, and and was the motivation for our measurement objectives. So our primary objective was to map out the large scale plumes of oxygen and CO two, uh, and then a secondary objective was to measure the ratios between oxygen and CO two over various uh, spatial scales um, through different vertical extents of the atmosphere across the boundary layer top and through the middle troposphere. Other, uh, in, no less important measurement objectives, but ones that I won't uh, have time to talk about today include uh, attempts to actually directly estimate air sea fluxes through Lagrangian uh, budgeting flights, where we fly uh, upwind and downwind legs. Uh, a remote sensing component where we had the PRISM hyperspectral remote sensor um, detecting ocean color to uh, help link our measurements to uh, what's going on in the ocean, but also for um, remote sensing specific objectives of algorithm development and um, and uh, teasing things out like the species distributions in various places in the Southern Ocean. Uh, we also had a big reactive gas component looking at um, uh, chemicals important for uh, both ozone and um, cloud feedbacks um, that are produced by algae in the Southern Ocean. And uh, you know, you take a plane like this down to a place where it, you, there are so few measurements, you want to exploit it as much as you can. So we also put on as many aerosol and cloud microphysics sensors as we could, and we have a, a team of people analyzing those. This is what the inside of the G5 looks like. I, I as in in response to Ken's comment, um, this is probably the only G5 with beige carpeting and no bar or a hot tub or whatever else you get in the G5. Um, it's uh, it's still uh, very nice as far as research aircraft go goes. It's uh, you know not unlike a, a research ship. You pack it as full as you possibly can when you're heading out. Um, so we have about ten instrument racks. Sorry, about ten people on board, and maybe something like um, seven or eight racks on this campaign. That's uh, Ian McCubbin, who was running the JPL Prism instrument, and you can see some uh, one of our whole air samplers, the uh, AWAS system. That's um, uh, measuring reactive gases. The thing on the left is uh, GCMS uh, called TOGA that's um, measuring a lot of other reactive gases. My instrument that measures oxygen is back here and um, and then some other stuff. So the, uh, I won't go through the entire payload, but we had um, redundant measurements of oxygen and CO2 um, from a number of, uh, from different sensors at whole air samplers. Uh, and, and notably the CO2 measurements we're deploying are are really um, the highest precision CO2 measurement you can make. Uh, and the gradients uh, are small over the Southern Ocean, but um, by measuring them at this really high precision, we're able to see things we weren't able to see before. So in addition to the, all these great um, instrument tools, we um, we uh, have, have some wonderful modeling resources and a lot of effort uh, was thrown uh, in, in the short period of time between when we were funded and when we deployed. Uh, to develop these. Matt Long uh, developed uh, a version of CESM that could be run uh, uh, as a forecast model. Uh, so uh, what he's showing here in this diagram is that he's using uh, meteorological um, fields, uh, forecast fields from the GEOS-5 model to nudge the atmospheric component of a, of a Earth system model. So uh, what this does is it essentially uh, makes the atmosphere uh, match uh, the real world in terms of where the storms are and where the fronts are 
Uh, and then also that, that was driving um, air-sea gas exchange. So where the wind was blowing hard, you had more gas exchange. Um, and the, the, the implementation of this because of, you know, trying to get it going as a forecast model um, is, is, is slightly distinct from, or is, is distinct from CESM. So the, the, the results shouldn't be viewed as the same as what you might see in a, say, a CMET 5 study. But uh, it, it was incredibly useful to have this during the field campaign uh, to build up our intuition about what, what we might see on a particular day to target different events uh, and to think about the processes responsible for for what we were measuring. So I'm going to show an animation. What, what resolution model. does the atmospheric model have? Uh, let me see if I can go back. So the version of CAM that he's that he was using, uh, Matt may be on the line. I don't know if there's a way to unmute him, Roberto. Yeah, just one second. Uh, I, I could guess, but since we know, since we have the resources to get the real answer. All right, so Matt should be unmuted. I think he may have muted himself, but we'll see. <laughs> there he goes. Well, I guess I was just looking at something. Uh, yeah, I'm going yeah, to guess. I'm going to guess it was the one, de uh, something like a one degree atmospheric simulation, but it's. Um, can you can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Oh, there you are, Matt. Yeah, it's a, it's nominally one degree. Okay. So, and we also had we we're also um, uh, working with the AMPS group. You're probably familiar with the Antarctic. Uh, I think it might be mesoscale prediction system. It's a, a version of WARF that's run here out of NCAR to support the Antarctic operations. And we had a nine kilometer um, version of AMPS that uh, that was providing uh, weather briefings every day and was you know a lot better than other things that we could get for the region and all, you know also really useful we did not have amps coupled up to biogeochemical fluxes um, but uh, but both of these tools are being used in our post analyses okay yeah feel free to interrupt with questions at any time i what i was going to do with this uh, simulation was actually um, say a few things about it and then uh, invite questions on the first half of the talk um, uh, I haven't shown any measurements yet. It's all been motivation so far, but I, I'm going to get to them soon. But so this is on the top. The colors are the surface or atmospheric boundary layer concentrations of oxygen. Uh, and the black lines are the oxygen fluxes. Um, the positive fluxes are in solid lines and where fluxes are, sorry, the outgassing fluxes are in solid lines and ingassing fluxes are um, in dashed lines. And you'll see the fluxes um, are daily fluxes. The movie is at hourly resolution, so the daily fluxes sort of jump every 24 frames. And on the bottom is the same for CO2. Um, so at the, the start of this thing, you see a couple large plumes of uh, positive oxygen anomalies, uh, which are matched with negative CO2 anomalies. So I'm going to click play here. If it's not working for you, uh, there's a YouTube link where you can look at the movie separately. Um, so you see the fluxes jumping around. This is in December um well before we got there uh but you see negative correlations between these anomalies and 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 what's most striking is that um the distributions are very episodic you have these large sort of blow-ups of oxygen and and uh drawdowns of co2 over certain regions that then infect downwind sort of as filaments um for a period of several days so I'm it's sorry. Possible. yeah go ahead uh, what is the mechanism for producing these blowouts? Is it an ocean? Is it something you're doing to the ocean or something you're doing to the atmosphere? The, well, it's both. So we've looked at that and, and it's, it's, and it's definitely, um, we actually, I think we might even had some wagers about it during some of our planning meetings <laughs> because, um, what's, it, it, there are several things involved here. One is, uh, you know, a buildup of oxygen uh, and a drawdown of CO2 in the surface ocean because of, you know, mixed layer dynamics or blooms going on on the water side. And then with those anomalies um, present, uh, a fairly strong wind event coming along and, and, and pumping uh, the oxygen out and the CO2 in. Uh, but if the wind event is, is so strong that you get a lot of 
uh, vertical mixing in the atmosphere, then the signal is is diluted. So you can also get these sort of enhancements through um, uh, shallow atmospheric boundary layers. So they're, they're both are involved, but but in general, wh what you see um, is is that you get sort of a front coming through in a large uh, storm uh, or a large wind event that um, that hits an area, a productive area, and 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 that's what. And that's what produces these. Oh, wow. So, so the atmosphere is one degree, you said, and the ocean also? Uh, uh, that I'm pretty sure is one degree. Um, right, okay. Yeah, so Matt has um, a tenth of a degree simulation that he's run that we've looked at for some of these O2 CO2 relationships, but it's, of course, the spin up is not. Um, yeah. Um, Boy, this is really noisy, and, and it's like on 24 hour time scales, right? Each, each uh, the uh, black lines are 24 hour and the, and the colors are one hour resolution. Oh so, goodness. you know, the, yeah, so the fluxes from day to day jump quite a bit. So, um, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll just let this run for another little bit and ask if anyone, anyone else wants to ask questions about the motivation or background for the project before I, before I move on to what we actually uh, did and saw. Roberta, I guess you have a way of seeing hands raised or anything. Yeah, I don't see any okay. right. Great. Right. Um, so this is just a screen capture from that movie um, for the 21st of January, a day in which we a day in which we flew. So I wanted to freeze that and 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 say a little bit about what we were what we were trying to do. We, for a lot of the flights, we wanted to get these large scale um, cross sections to sort of measure the entire amount of oxygen and CO2 over the Southern Ocean, but we also wanted to sort of at higher resolution target some of these, these events. So on this particular day, we flew from Punta Arenas, which if you can see my mouse is right there, uh, down to the marginal ice zone uh, in the Bellion South and Sea, which was right about in the middle of the bullseye there. And then it did a transect to the north, uh, profiling up and down from the surface to um, I think around eight kilometers. Uh, and, and we headed for uh, a, a, a point that happened to be the OOI node out here. And we had, uh, um, let me see, I think I have the, uh, yeah, so this shows it a little bit more clearly in uh, map form. On the left is the flight track that we flew. Um, the bright yellow is the marginalized zone and the red is the pack ice. Um, clouds are shown on here and ocean color where there were no clouds. So we also wanted to, uh, with the PRISM remote sensor, um, do some legs out here uh, in the cloud-free region. And of course, it's hard to predict clouds um, anywhere uh, out in the middle of the ocean, but in particular, the Southern Ocean. So uh, the we ended up revising the flight plan. Um, Matt was on this flight, so, you know, made the call to sort of turn around and go back to where the clouds, where the, where the clouds were not so we could get the remote sensing in and then return to base. So in altitude time uh, space, this is what it looked like. The plane uh, initially flew up to 12 kilometers, did a dip down through the circumpolar jet uh, and back up, and then down to the surface along the ice edge in a series of short profiles. This is um, about 1,500 meters uh, to intensively sample the boundary layer gradients in this region. And then coming back to the north, um, profiling up to six or eight kilometers on the way back, returning to base. So the objectives, I've mentioned a few of them um, in the lower right there, but a large scale survey with some marginal ice zone um, sampling and some remote sensing. So this is what we saw for oxygen and CO2 on that flight. So I'm plotting um, altitude versus latitude. Uh, and the little white dots are the flight track itself, and then the plotting routine is just kind of filling in in between. Uh, but what you see very clearly on the left is this large outgassing signal of, for oxygen um, throughout the whole latitudinal cross section. Um, if I jump back two slides, you can see that what was forecast was sort of a, a, a really high oxygen anomaly on the sort of south of. 65 south, but a, a pretty steep gradient going north. So we saw oxygen high throughout the whole um, whole section. Um, 
but with different vertical extents and, and, and the greatest amount right over the marginal ice zone. Another interesting thing we saw on almost every flight for oxygen was uh, what's a, 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 an oxygen minimum right at the, the tropopause, so these purples up here. Um, the, our, our feature that's uh, it's a, a minimum there because uh, the air below is high because of summertime outgassing of oxygen and the air above is high because it's um, sort of six months old and oxygen is decreasing uh, rapidly in the atmosphere. So um, in, in, in profile, we always sort of saw this oxygen minimum right about the tropopause. Uh, this, these blues up here, actually, um, the green to blue transition is a gradient in the upper troposphere that's also being driven by hemispheric outgassing. So for CO2, we largely saw the inverse of this with um, strong drawdown signals um, down low and slightly different stuff going on up high. We, you know, we had some in our PI team were even skeptical that we would see, um, you know, CO2 gradients like this because we're so, we're so used to um, the signals for CO2 being fairly small over the Southern Ocean and the, and the instruments being um, not so precise. But this is the NOAA uh, CU Picaro instrument, which has a very high precision, and we just saw you know really clear drawdown signals in the atmosphere of up to two parts per, per million, um, and those can be used to make direct flux estimates. But um, we're also using them in in, in other um, in other ways along with oxygen. Uh, this plume in the upper right hand corner of CO two turns out to be um, sort of northern hemisphere fossil fuel signature air that's uh, invading the domain from the north um, at high altitude. And the jet is right about here where we did that dip. And so there's sort of a barrier between um, more northerly and more southerly air on either side of the, of the jet um, where the, this high CO2 plume, which also had every other pollutant we were measuring elevated in it, um, sort of contained to the north. Uh, and then this low CO2 in the upper left is that's the stratos low stratospheric air, which is low in CO2 because CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere or increasing in the troposphere steadily. So, uh, they, so in general, you see a really tight anti-correlation between oxygen and CO2 on this flight, where the, everywhere where we saw high oxygen, we saw low CO2. Uh, just for the fun of it, I'll show uh, DMS from this flight, which um, uh, you know is involved in uh, aerosol production. Um, and important for radiative effects. And, and it didn't actually correlate very well with oxygen, but it was very high right over the marginal ice zone. Um, concentrations of, of over 100 ppt. Uh, on other flights, we saw concentrations over 300 ppt. And the uh, interesting thing about DMS was that uh, we would go back to the same place on a different day and see you know, 5 ppt. So there's a lot of variability, and, and, and by looking into uh, more of the differences uh, on those days. Uh, we hope to learn uh, learn more about the the processes driving its uh, emissions. Some of the other biogenic gases actually did correlate really well with oxygen, so there's a lot to be learned there as well. Um, so that was what we did on one flight. This is what we did on the entire campaign. So uh, all of the white little dots you see here is every single flight from the entire campaign, 19 flights in total going up and down uh, almost all, all the time. And all I've done is bin the data uh, by latitude and altitude and average it up. So on the left, what you see is the clear outgassing signal of oxygen down low. Um, and on the right, what you see is the ingassing signal uh, of CO2 down low. So one of the first things we can do with, with data like this, essentially the whole campaign together, is just to add up how many moles of oxygen there are over the Southern Ocean um, during these six weeks and how many moles of CO2 there are. And we have, um, we have ways with atmosphere transport models to relate you know, the, the, the measurements we're actually making on individual flight days to what the sort of zonal mean um, uh, average is if you flew on every day is. And it turns out that doing flights like this, you get a very good um, representation of the zonal mean uh, long term or, you know, every, everyday average. Essentially, by flying uh, an airplane over these spatial scales and then averaging multiple days, a lot of the synoptic variability drops out and, and you, you get a pretty good estimate of what's there. So then with those numbers, 
uh, we can constrain how much oxygen has come out of the Southern Ocean over the preceding um, several months and how much CO2 has gone into the ocean over the preceding several, several months. So that's, those are numbers that we'll be calculating and uh, using to test, uh, to test various models. Um, the other thing that we can do with the entire set of flight data is look at the correlations between oxygen and CO2. And just visually here, you, you can see that um, there, is, uh, there is a good correlation. The, the oranges on the left match up with blues on the right. But I've gone ahead and made a XY plot of that. Again, oxygen on the y-axis and CO2 on the x-axis. And the solid red plots are all of the data below eight kilometers. Uh, in the stratosphere, you see uh, oxygen gradients um, that don't have tight correlations with CO2, um, which is not unexpected. But in the troposphere, uh, oxygen and CO2 averaged over a six-week period are very well correlated, which is, um, I, I wouldn't say surprising, but is somewhat um, newsworthy in the sense that this plot could have been a total shotgun blast. We wouldn't have known until we actually went out and flew what this was going to look like. So the ratio you get if you put a line through that is uh, with an orthogonal distance regression is negative 2.7 moles of oxygen per mole of CO2. So uh, what that number means will be the subject of, of ongoing analysis, but in general it, it implies that uh, you know, biological production of oxygen and, and um, consumption of CO2 is dominating the atmospheric signals over the Southern Ocean at this time of year. Um, and, and the slope is uh, because of the buffering chemistry of CO2 is uh, not, um, is not uh, too surprising that you get more moles of oxygen out than you get um, moles of CO2 in. There are also big differences in the response times, of course, of air sea gas exchange for those two gases. So it's essentially an emergent um, uh, product or uh, emergent feature of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the real world or of an Earth system model, but uh, something that can be used as, a, as an important test of, of, of the model. So we'll be um, calculating this from CESM as well as um, other models that we, we have on hand. Uh, so thinking more about where does, you know, where does this uh, ratio come from and why is it so well correlated, uh, Matt made some plots from the forecast model of just um, the same thing, but for, um, for uh, sort of every grid box in the model over the eastern, uh, South Pacific, the eastern Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean. And what you see on an individual day is something uh, that can be quite different. So this is just four different days from the campaign. January 15th, January 20th, which was the day before that flight I showed, February 5th, uh, 15th and February 25th. And, uh, and, and the plot, so the day before with that particular flight we showed, you see something that looks a little bit like the all campaign plot, which is you know this strong anti-correlation um, over a fairly large range. The, the white, the points are colored by altitude, so the white points here are in the stratosphere. And this is just for the ocean component of the model. So it doesn't include um, smaller influences from land or um, fossil fuel fluxes coming in from the north. Uh, but, but, but the general picture, um, uh, I think, is consistent. So what, the interesting thing is that on some days you see, you know, I don't know what you'd call this, a dinosaur footprint or a maple leaf, um, where you have uh, clearly influences in the atmosphere from very different regions. Um, one, you know, some regions that have anti-correlations, you know, suggestive of a bloom, but at, you know, slightly different ratios. And then two other regions that uh, have um, positive correlations suggesting both uh, O2 and CO2 outgassing. So the simple interpretation here would be that, you know, these two arms um, reflect air coming from some place where thermal fluxes were dominating. So you're heating up the surface ocean and driving both gases out. And these two arms are areas where, um, where biology is dominating. So having the SOCOM floats out there in different regions um, will, be very, will be very useful um, to try and tease this out. But the model runs that Matt has done you know, suggests that um, the CO2 and o O2 fluxes sort of taper off uh, at different times in different um, latitudes. So there's things going on in the northern part of the domain that are quite a bit different than the southern part. And the same is probably true uh, zonally. 
Uh, and we have uh, a Lagrangian, atmospheric Lagrangian particle dispersion model set up to link our measurements uh, in terms of the regions of influence. So we'll be able to map sort of the regions uh, of influence of our airborne measurements and in the cases where there are SOCOM floats within those regions, we'll be really interested to look at um, what they were seeing. The other thing that jumps out from this plot is that um, the fluxes and the, the model forecast fluxes were uh, were dying off as the campaign went along. So these plots sort of converged to a, a small clump by the end of the campaign because the oxygen fluxes and the CO2 fluxes are forecast to, to be both be weakening. Uh, and that's shown more clearly in the top two panels here. This is again from the forecast model uh, for the entire Southern Ocean, the oxygen fluxes from December through, sorry, the axis got cut off there, but that's um, uh, essentially through early March. So the end of the campaign was right about at the zero crossing for both of these gases um, uh, in the model. Um, and that's consistent with a lot of the uh, SOCOM float data. This is um, one particular float that I believe was deployed from the um, OOI the servicing crews. Um, and what you see here going early to late from blue to red is that at the start of the ORCAS campaign, um, this float saw oxygen supersaturation, um, implying strong outgas influxes, but by the end of the campaign, this sort of orange, the fluxes were, or the, sorry, the supersaturation was about um, in equilibrium uh, and trending towards, trending towards oxygen uptake. Uh, and then that's also apparent from what we saw in the atmosphere. So this is the same plot I showed before on the left of oxygen from Research Flight 3 on January 21st. And on February 24th, uh, almost five weeks later, we, we went back to the essentially the exact same spot. So I don't have a map here, but this uh, flight followed that same flight track fairly closely. Um, and uh, what we saw on, on, um, on the 24th of February was less oxygen coming out of the surface of the Southern Ocean. And if you look really closely, you can kind of see that um, the concentrations nearest to the ocean surface were actually slightly lower than those just above the ocean surface. So, um, we still have to look in detail at the atmospheric transport, but there is the suggestion of uh, possibly of this um, air having seen oxygen uptake rather than oxygen outgassing. Whereas in January, we saw this, the highest oxygen concentrations right near the surface. So there's a clear temporal evolution of the fluxes uh, over the time of the campaign, as well as um, some interesting spatial differences. So I'll summarize uh, there and uh, just report that we completed our campaign successfully and, and, and these are the number of profiles we flew. Um, you know, so almost 200 uh, up and down uh, and 62 of those go over 12 kilometers. We're collaborating with the OCO2 uh, team on using those for satellite validation. Um, and uh, all of them, uh, including um, a smaller number that sort of turned around down low, you know, covered the the boundary layer transition. So we have almost 200 uh, profiles across the atmospheric boundary layer. The, the sort of the big whole campaign results that are jumping out early is that, that we measured the total amount of oxygen CO2 over the ocean, Southern Ocean very well. And those will provide important um, constraints on seasonal uh, time scales and, and hemispheric spatial scales. The oxygen and CO2 fluxes coming out of Southern Ocean are definitely negatively correlated during summer, um, despite what um, you know, some of the CMIP-5 models would, would suggest, um, reflecting the dominance of, of biological influences. And the evolution of these spatial, dis the evolution of, of the total amount and the spatial distributions will be um, very useful uh, as we get further along in our analyses. There are many other uh, exciting results coming out of the reactive gas remote sensing and cloud microphysics measurements we made. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk about those today. Um, and we see a lot of opportunities for uh, collaborating with uh, others doing measurements in the Southern Ocean. This is just a, a quick list of the, all of the synergistic things going on during the Orcas campaign. There were the SOCOM floats out there. Um, we were linking up with the LTR crews on the Gould uh, that had um, 
the normal LTR measurements as well as Nikola Kassar's delta O2 argon measurements, PCO2, DIC nutrients, and atmospheric oxygen CO2 all going on. Palmer's been collecting flasks, of course, for a long time for oxygen and CO2. We did fly over the OOI node. Um, and there were a number of biogeochemical gliders deployed and of course the OCO2 satellite. So just a few things um, to finish with in terms of um, what we hope to work on with the SOCOP team. Um, one is just exploring these O2 and CO2 flux, um, fluxes and ratios um, from, the float, com from combining the float data, the model, and the atmospheric observations. And a big sort of, um, I think, uh, uh, sort of icing on the cake to look forward to in a few years will be when the SASI estimates are up for this time period uh, to run them through an atmospheric transport model and do direct sort of validation of the, of the, of the state estimate fluxes. And I'm sure there are a lot of others that we will uh, be able to come up with in collaboration. So I'm just going to uh, play a movie uh, to finish up uh, to give you an idea of what, what it's actually like to do these flights. And um, I'll talk for a few minutes about what's going on, and then I'll stop talking and invite questions. So this is that flight I showed, Research Flight 3 out of Punta Arenas. So you saw a bit of land there. That was uh, um, Tierra del Fuego, I believe. and the forward-looking camera on the G5 uh, ices up frequently when, when you go through icing conditions, but um, at least during summer down there, the ice uh, is not, the ice, aircraft icing is not a huge problem. So there, right now there's a lens of ice on the camera that will slowly um, sublimate away, uh, improving the, the sort of focus. So we're climbing out of Punta Arenas, heading south um, and heading to, um, something like 40,000 feet or 12 kilometers. And I will just uh, speed this up a little bit to get to what, so to get to the sort of Belling Thousand Sea where we started descending. So let me see, here we go. So now we're gonna do a series of, um, of low, uh, what we call porpoises down to the surface of the ocean um, and back up to 5,000 feet three or four times. You can see on the plane a couple of the just standard aircraft pressure temperature sensors, but the things we sample from are back. So here we go down into the boundary layer um, at our southernmost uh, point. Um, lots of pretty icebergs around. And it really does, you know, of course this is sped up, but it's, it really does uh, feel like you're flying, um, like you're sort of water skiing down there. Um, we typically went to about 500 feet, but we would go lower if the um, boundary layer was really stable and we wanted to dip into it. And um, 500 feet felt really low at, at those speeds. Um, but the nice thing about doing these flights and riding along on the plane is that you, you, know, you get this really intuitive sense for what's going on because you can watch all the signals being measured in real time. You feel the plane start to bump and so you know immediately you're in the, boundary, the atmospheric boundary layer and, and, then, and then soon after you see all the signals on the oxygen and CO2 sensors jumping. Um, there's another nice icing event. So the, um, the cloud microphysics people, of course, love this type of stuff. Um, and they're just, it's not possible to avoid clouds uh, in this part of the world. So we sampled quite a few of them. Um, so now the plane's going to do a series of profiles to about eight kilometers on the way back. So maybe I'll just let this run and, and ask if there are uh, questions. Thanks, hey, Britt. That uh, was really great. Britt, for the uh, O2, CO2 plot that you had for the data below 8,000 meters, uh, yep. do you have a sense of what the integration time would be for that? That was uh, the, the red XY plot. Um, those were bin from the entire uh, campaign. So um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by integration time, but that's reflecting sort of this long-term average and the, and, the, and the points that were the most to the upper left of the plot, so the highest oxygen and lowest CO2 were, um, uh, were the points that were sort of near the marginal ice zone that we, we sampled on multiple flights, but they always had high oxygen and low CO2. So the boundary layers tend to have, a, uh, the atmospheric boundary layer tends to have a lifetime of several days. So um, 
so and of course the oxygen fluxes have that you know responding to a bloom or over a time scale of maybe a week and the co2 fluxes that are responding to the sort of seasonal drawdown have a time scale of months so there there are a lot of uh, time scales to think about on all of this, but I, I sort of view that correlation plot as reflecting something on more of monthly time scales. Okay, thanks. I mean, the, the, the other half of that question is what is this, when you see the low drawdown, you know, in, in the boundary layer, what is the footprint, spatial footprint of that? So, we, so right, so we're running this, I didn't get to show any of it, but we're running this, uh, um, Lagrangian particle dispersion model called STILT stands for stochastic time inverted Lagrangian transport. So you were able to really, and um, Martin, um, Hogan Martinez and Eric Court at the University of Michigan are, are doing that. And they're uh, releasing, you know, sort of from uh, points along the flight track, something like 10,000 particles that go backwards in an atmospheric transport model um, and are perturbed uh, stochastically. So you get this sort of cloud of particles back in time. And from that, you can infer where uh, surface fluxes might have, when those particles are in the boundary layer, uh, where surface fluxes might have influenced the atmospheric measurements. And you can get maps of, of influence functions. The thing about this, you know, we're, we're used to looking at those over the continental US and you get this nice big round, roundish influence uh, map um, because of a lot, there's a lot of, diff, uh, of wind shear and convection going on. But in the Southern Ocean, the wind is blowing hard and it's blowing from, you know, from somewhere really far away. So the influence maps, the influence functions for those boundary layer samples tend to be sort of long streaks that go upwind. Um, and, and of course, it's um, the near field fluxes have a bigger influence or can have a bigger influence than the far field fluxes. So to turn that into flux estimates, you have to make some assumptions about the spatial distribution or the spatial correlation lengths of the fluxes themselves. But in general, you know, you can think about, you know, a two-day lifetime in the atmospheric boundary layer and how far the air would get in two days. So it's, it's big. It's, um, you know, on the order of 1,000 kilometers upwind. But these features that you saw in the forecast model tended to be, you know, pr probably not bigger than 1,000 kilometers in general. And, and, and we were clearly able to detect those. Yeah, have you, have you attempted to do an estimate of the uh, the magnitude of the fluxes that are required to do it over over you know like choosing a certain area? Yeah, so we have uh, you know in our sort of um, menu of things that different members of the science team are pursuing uh, several different methods of est directly fl estimating fluxes. So using those influence functions that are defined by the Lagrangian particles, yeah, back, right. backwards particles, you can actually convolve. So here we are coming into Punta Arenas. Just <laughs> you'll see the landing gear come out here in a second, and uh, and then we're and then we're done. Um, so that was about an eight-hour flight in a few minutes. So um, so so you can convolve all of the fluxes to uh, so all of the influence functions for the entire campaign to estimate um, a flux. And, and to do that, you usually need some prior guess of the fluxes uh, uh, that you then you then try to optimize in a Bayesian framework um, and try and come up with your best guess of the fluxes to match the observations. Um, so we'll be doing that and then we'll also be doing that on individual flight days. And there were a couple um, flights in particular uh, where, um, where we did um, specific Lagrangian studies. So this flight over the Patagonian shelf where of course the um, you know chlorophyll A from space is really high um, all you know all summer long. Uh, we did a, 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 an upwind fence and then uh, did some remote sensing for a few hours and then did a downwind fence um, and, and you can see evidence of gas exchange in between those two points. So that would give you a flux estimate for a particular patch of the ocean on a particular day. Uh, we also did two flights towards the end of the campaign um, where we did an upwind fence um, in the region of, uh, that was that uh, last flight I showed, RF-17, it went back down here towards the uh, Bellingshausen Sea and came back up. And then um, the next day we went out and flew a downwind fence over here by Elephant Island um, and tried to measure the same air a day later. 
uh, mm -hmm. and that will support some measurements, some estimates of the fluxes in between. That was, of course, at a time when the fluxes were quite, um, quite a bit weaker than earlier in the campaign, and possibly um, sort of reversed. So, um, so it, it'll be interesting to see what um, what sort of precision we can get on those fluxes. But it's mm -hmm. the type of thing that's never been attempted from from the air for these gases, over the ocean for these gases. It's done quite a bit over land. It'll be really interesting to see if those uh, fluxes that Seth sent you are anywhere in the right order of magnitude to give you what you're observing. It doesn't, initially it doesn't seem like it, does it? That, um, you mean that the model fluxes match yeah. up? Yeah. Yeah, well, so not model. No, I mean sets aren't models. No, no, right, right. Okay, I wasn't sure if you were referring to math model or, or the. Model. No, no, I was referring to set stuff. Oh uh, yeah, I guess I would res to respond to both, or to, to finish my thought on the model was that the um, Matt's forecast model did a really good job of of predicting where these uh, events would be. There were times when we flew, you know, somewhere where um, the highest oxygen was observed, you know, over as a filament that was blowing downwind from somewhere else. And so it was, it was spatially, it seemed to be doing a, a, a really nice job. The magnitudes are not um, the same. So the model, the magnitude of the model oxygen and CO2 anomalies um, differed quite a bit from observed. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to looking uh, more closely at the stuff that uh, Seth is working on and the plots he's already shared. Um, and thinking about sort of what the, um, yeah, what, whether they're consistent with what we think we would see for fluxes or not. And what, of course, the model can play an important role if we're able to sort of um, get what we think is a reasonable estimate of what the fluxes might have been from the model. We can do sort of direct comparisons to both um, the atmospheric measurements in one direction and the ocean and uh, floats in another direction. Oh, just, just to throw out a question or a comment, I've got so to run. The, um, thanks, Jorge. And my wife for dinner. <laughs> Thank you. Madrid. Really yeah. appreciate it. That was great. Bye bye. Talk to you soon. So, just a quick a quick comment that that one one thing that came became clear in playing around with with perturbations with the Nemo model is that um, perhaps the large intraseasonal variability you can see in APO in the Palmer Station data and also in the Japanese data. Um, so. I would say, I would infer, at least it's a plausible idea from, from sensitivity studies with NEMO, that, that the intraseasonal variability that you see is, is, um, is a result of, of sheer turbulence in the ocean rather than you know, tur turbulence from eddies. And I think that categorically, the models are pretty bad at doing that. I don't even, I don't think, I think even with the simulation that Saucy won't, you know, won't get that. So I think I think that there's there's and I, I guess I, I I remember Matt mentioning that he was gonna he there were some things he was gonna look at with some tur more explicit turbulence modeling but I think for for the modeling side um, yeah there's this this is very useful to the model development people because it, it 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 helps them to frame a real strong limitation of the models I mean I don't think that one tenth of a degree models are gonna get this I think it's because basically they still don't have the shear induced turbulence correct you know represent process representation correct yeah I, thanks Keith that I mean, that's a really good point and something I hadn't um, you know <laughs> when I see a tenth of a degree model I think wow that's you know amazing it's got to be um, you know it's, it's got to be right so uh, so the uh, the thing that you know we had Matt uh, Maslov was out for one of our science planning meetings we talked a bunch about um, Saucy and how you know you know how the fronts may or may not or the eddies may or may not match up um, I think, you know, even if you don't think they're going to be in the right place, um, a lot can be done just looking at um, sort of scales of variability. We have this data set in the atmosphere and you can, um, you can analyze it in terms of uh, the scales of variability of oxygen and CO2. And if, you know, obviously if you throw a one degree model at this, it's going to, um, for the ocean or the atmosphere, you're, you're going to be smoothing out a lot of, a lot of the real variability. Um, uh, and then, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff that uh, Matt Long has been looking at in terms of the evolution of the flux sort of north and south of the polar front and what, you know, what drives, um, what drives sort of the net production to, you know, collapse at different times in different simulations. And, uh, he, you know, as you go, just, you know, 
given the caveats on spin up, uh, you know, at the 10 degree simulations that he looked at had, you know, just completely different temporal evolution of, of productivity that I think he was suggesting was related to um, iron supply to the ring boundary layer being different. But again, if, you know, so what resolution do you need then if 10 is not good enough? Well, I mean, it, it, it could be that, that um, a better understanding of things like the, the, the way um, inertial oscillations work in the ocean or different, I mean, there's, there's process understanding that you, the, the seasonal structure of the boundary layer in the, in the ocean may be um, somewhat independent of the, of, the, of the horizontal resolution problem. So, I mean, but just, just, to, just to turn this more to the, a little bit to the data side, so let's let's assume for the sake of argument it does turn out that 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 um, that you know episodic events storm storms coming through and forcing shear induced turbulence to to mix you know to 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 destratify the, the the planetary boundary layer it's sort of the opposite sign of what you get with eddies so the question there would be with on the Argo side what are are is the current sampling of the Argo floats able to I mean, how, how often do they resurface, or is it is it would you would you be able to follow sort of the response to a storm of, of an individual you know float? Would a float be able to track, or or is 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 it sort of time to be too? Is is, is it just tracking a different temporal scale, focused on the seasonal cycle or something? Yeah, they're on ten day cycles right now, and um, I don't. I mean, given the short term variability that you saw in the model output that you showed, I think you'd be hard pressed to capture that with, you know, individual events with floats. Maybe on average you, you get the seasonal signal, but um, that might be, you know, a combination where, where saucy really could come into play. So so is it is it possible if if if, if coordinating with somebody like Britt, basically if you could say is it is it possible with one of the one of the Argo floats to, to actually go in and override the the time of you know the vertical migration and the sort of if a storm is coming through to monitor that or I wonder if that would be I wonder if there's an interesting uh, yeah, way I, of I I think that sounds like a great idea not knowing anything about the um, <laughs> the, the, the operation of the, uh, the, uh, the floats themselves but we did you know we did chat with Matt and Lynn and Ken uh, before Orcas because you know they were uh, you know really uh, great about getting some extra floats out in uh, before our campaign. I think some strings had to be pulled there. So that was fantastic. But one of the things that we'd also sort of inquired about was, um, you know, could you maybe program them to go up and down every few days for the first, you know, couple weeks of their life and then go, go to this 10 day cycle. And I think that, you know, operationally that was not feasible. So there may be challenges to this, but, you know, just thinking ahead, um, you know, a proposal or something to, you know, try and configure a particular flow for. I think, you know, we did think about trying to structure some flights around this idea of watching a, a wind event come through and then seeing how the system sort of relaxed over several days. And operationally, it didn't really work out from a flight planning point of view to, to fly um, like that. We, we probably caught some of that just by accident by flying when we did for other reasons. But, um, but yeah, to program a float that you could say, okay, here comes, you know, the float is coming up on its 10-day cycle and it happens to be right where there's forecast to be a big wind event tomorrow. So let's, when it's up, tell it to do a profile every day for five days or something. I, I don't, I don't yeah. even know if that's feasible, but I like the idea. No, the, the thing that just, I, I won't go on and on about this, but the, the thing that's actually kind of, why the reason it might be good to, to have that as a more organized, organized kind of, you know, this process question is because not all storms, there have to be the resin, I think it's in the large papers from the 90s, the large and Crawford papers, but you have, not all storms will have the resonant frequencies, if inertial oscillations are important, that are gonna excite this kind of vertical mixing. So the storm has to have particular resonant frequencies in it that correspond to, you know, the core, basically the local dynamical, um, yeah. the, the, the local dynamical system. So. So you would, you would, you know, I don't know whether it's from, from, from Bill Large's papers, it's not clear whether one third of the time or nine tenths of the time you're going to get this resonance and mixing. But you, it would need to be more than just one time you would do it. You would want to get the statistics. So. Well, so, what? yeah, you know, um, they, they do deploy those floats from aircraft. And uh, part of my, um, you know, sort of part of my day job is uh, promoting 
uh, the NCAR NSF aircraft uh, facility. So you want to write a request for the C-130 to go down there and sit for a month and go drop, you know, drop biogeochemical Argo flights right in front of a bunch of different storms. That would, uh, that would be a really cool study. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is, is technically feasible. It's, it, you know, kind of, you can make, we can make the float cycle once a day, once every 12 hours, if, is about the limit, but it, you know, impacts the lifetime of the float and the overall SOCOM objective of getting the really, you know, the, the interannual and, and seasonal variability, but, you know, it could be done. Yeah, that's why I thought probably an add-on proposal would be in order. So do we have any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. It's super talk. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, everyone else. Yeah, thank yeah. you. This is our last webinar, like Ken said, so we'll see everybody in the fall. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brett.